Today is a really exciting live. So the world, I think, can paint a very boring picture of scientists and old fashioned syllabuses often reinforce that by making science really boring at school. So for ages as a kid, I thought being a scientist would be a really boring job, like stuck in a white lab coat in a lab all the time. And now I know that that is so wrong. Our inspiring guest today seems to spend half her time in scuba gear, exploring the world's most fascinating underwater forests, pushing boundaries of understanding beyond anything we've known before. But she's not just exploring, she's changing things. She is a genuine superhero, leading the efforts to restore so much of what industrialization has lost to safe has lost to try and safeguard nature and humanity. She's published numerous articles, been involved in films, art, new media, and is a world expert on, angle, on algal forests, seagrass meadows, and how the climate crisis is affecting ecology. Doctor, Dr. Adriana Vegas, it's a real pleasure to welcome you onto our online school today. Hello. Um, so just to start off with, um, hi. Uh, so Phil, our English teacher, has been trying to convince me that there are more species, more marine species in, in just that tiny little bit of Sydney Harbour than the entire of UK coastal waters. Is that reasonable? I believe for some taxa that is true. I think for fish in particular, I think that we have more diversity of fish in Sydney Harbour than in the UK. Um, people, at least, you know, my colleagues uh, often give that stat. So I, I believe that is true. That's unbelievable. Um, also, there are loads, loads of people joining. Venable Sugar is joining. Leonardo is joining. Jeff is joining. Dino Pizius is joining. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Um, so yes, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna kind of hand this over to Adriana. She's got a story that she's gonna tell all of you guys, um, and I'll just kind of move things around uh, and, and allow her to take it away. So here, I'll bring up your first image, if you'd like. Shall I bring it up? Um, well, actually, just before you do that, I wanted to ask people out there, and maybe ask you as well. So, you know, people, when they think of a marine scientist, they have all these kind of fabulous kind of ideas of a very sophisticated and glamorous job where we spend time on our boats and study whales and big things. But um, my subject of study, my passion are actually seaweeds, right? Uh, so I'd like to know, what do people think of when they think of, of seaweeds? And I'd, I'd like people to be honest, of course. Gentleman scientist is saying hi as well. Um, when I think of seaweeds, I always think of those ones that um, it's weird. It's like a thing that was stuck in my mind as a child. Those ones that are like a bubble, and you and you kind of pop the bubble. I only just realised that the bubbles were there to make them float. Because for me, yeah. I was just like, yeah. as a child, I just thought the bubbles were there for me to pop, and that they were just providing fun. <laughs> um, so people right. are saying here, um, Miz thinks of green slimy things. Uh, Leonardo thinks of algae, Catherine thinks of green slimy stuff, um, Anna is saying underwater forests, Catherine is saying food for okay. fish, um, and Penguin is saying they look cool, especially the brown stringy wavy ones, and Venable Sugar is saying things lying on the beach. Okay, well that's 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 not bad actually. Um, I think when when a lot of people think of seaweeds, they often think of just um, kind of smelly rack and lying on the beach, you know, and it's not nice and it kind of hurts your feet when you're walking over it, and it's yeah because it doesn't smell good. You you know, I think a lot of people, especially you know in the UK or in Ireland, would have that association. But I guess what I, what I hope that we'll achieve um, by the end of our session today is to show how seaweeds are actually incredibly beautiful, incredibly important as a habitat, but also that they can really help us save our planet. Um, they are they have some properties that are very unique and that I think can really be helpful. Um, they can contribute to curbing climate change, but they can also actually play a role in, in sustainable fashion, you know, in things that, um, then, you know, they, people may not realize, right? Um, I guess to begin with, I wanted to just briefly talk a little bit of Biology 101 about, you know, what are uh, seaweeds? So maybe if you can show the slide where there's the forest and the plankton and all of that. Um, so Ooh, seaweeds- the forest and the plankton. So not the seaweed all over the beach? Oh, uh, you could have, yeah, I'll just that's show that cool. quickly because it's first. 
Um, this is just a picture of seaweed all over the beach, which is kind of what it looks like to a lot of people, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. That's what I think people think of when they think of seaweeds. But um, maybe show the, the slide with the, um, the photo that has the forests and the plankton and I've all of it. that, because it's a good kind of representation of all the different types of seaweeds, right? So, and, and that's the thing. So seaweeds, and we also call them algae, kind of interchangeably, pretty much. Uh, but they come in all shapes and sizes. And in fact, it's actually very difficult to define them. They don't form one group. Um, I guess if you had to define them, you'd say, okay, they're aquatic and they photosynthesize. So this means that they um, produce oxygen, they take up carbon and they produce carbohydrates, right? So algae but some of them are seaweeds. Sorry? Algae yeah. equals seaweeds. Hmm, algae make. are seaweeds, yeah. Right. People generally call seaweeds the bigger algae, right? So algae can be microscopic, like phytoplankton, they're algae. They can be bacteria, like cyanobacteria, but they can also be like 45 meter kind of forests, right? So they they, they really do come in all shapes and sizes. And we have a very uh, sophisticated, way, sophisticated way of um, classifying them into green, brown, and red. So kind of, uh, very simple, but they, they do come in those kind of different colors. They belong to different kind of taxonomic groups. There's not one ancestor that kind of unites all seaweeds. Um, anyway, um, so I guess, you know, so seaweeds, they, 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 they photosynthesize, they come in all shapes and sizes. Now, why are they important? Um, well, one of the main things that they do is that they produce oxygen. And if you can just show that photo of the um, uh, microscopic cyanobacteria. I also really want to come back to one of the pictures, the top, the top right picture here of like the structures. But anyway, I'll go, I'll go to the cyanobacteria. Here you go. So cyanobacteria are kind of like the first photosynthesizers in the planet. So these are the cells that first evolve the capacity of producing oxygen. They are considered algae, even though they are bacteria. And they're, they're what we call prokaryotes, which is like a, a, a very simple type of cell that doesn't have a nucleus, doesn't have organelles, right? And photosynthesis happens in the kind of outer layer. Um, so that's, that's, you know, cyanobacteria, super primitive, but super, super important because they started creating oxygen in our atmosphere. So before cyanobacteria evolved, sorry? Sorry to interrupt you. I, I want to ask you a quick question about that. So I heard a vicious rumor that early cyanobacteria were a different color. And so if you could be in outer space many, many years ago, then the earth might not look green. It might look purple instead. Is that true? That I've no idea, but um, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. I mean, we call them blue green algae, yeah. uh, cyanobacteria, so a lot of them do have that bluish kind of coloration, but um, but yeah, so imagine, right? So there's you know the beginning of life on Earth, these cells start photosynthesizing, they start producing oxygen, and they change the atmosphere in a very fundamental way. Uh, it's now an oxidizing environment, and if you show, um, you know, there's the graph of atmospheric oxygen and how it's changed through time. Oh yeah. And that yeah, is yeah. The only, that's the only graph that we're gonna show. Um, and basically like at the bottom of this graph, we have billions of years before now, right? And we can see how at the beginning there was no oxygen at all. And then about 3.2 billion years ago, we started um, um, cyanobacteria evolved. They started producing oxygen. And that's when the atmosphere started to become oxidized. And then the cyanobacteria you know, evolved into other plants of algae, and then we got higher plants, and then, you know, at the end, we got the atmosphere that we have today, which has about 21% oxygen, right? And obviously, without oxygen, we couldn't leave. Um, so, yeah, very important. So, without seaweeds, without algae, we will be here, for sure, and the atmosphere will not have oxygen. I've got a few few questions coming in that I'm going to ask you now. Um, but also, just to kind of give people an, an idea of how different the atmosphere, the world must have been like back here when there was no oxygen, you could have just walked around the world and there would have just been shiny metal all over the floor because it's only oxygen that, that turns the metal into, into minerals and, and ores and things like that. It would have been so different. Um, and this is called the, the, this is sometimes called the oxygen catastrophe. 
Um, mm-hmm. And Adriana, I wanted to, to ask you to quickly tell people why this, this thing is sometimes called the oxygen catastrophe. You know what? I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not. I'm not actually sure why the term catastrophe. I've, I've heard other terms, um, but no. You you tell me actually. Oh, sorry. Well, maybe it's the collo- again a colloquial one I've got. Um, but it's the because that's the point when um, all of uh, evolution had to shift so suddenly, and something like ninety-seven percent of all marine species died died out there was this huge bottleneck and suddenly like loads of the species on earth completely disappeared because oxygen was poisonous to so many things and it just completely transformed everything into what we have today anyway um another quick couple of questions yeah i guess i guess like all catastrophes uh, it was the beginning of a new world which is the one that we live on yeah today so yeah um, so another couple of questions that uh came in were so pangler was asking is kelp um a seaweed and uh, Green Mangaman was asking, which is maybe something we'll, we'll go on to later, if seaweeds are able to remove mercury from the water. So kelp is a seaweed, yep. It's a brown seaweed. Um, and it's, you know, mm, relatively kind of later. It, it evolved a lot later than cyanobacteria. But yeah, it's, 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 it's one of the most complex seaweeds um, around. Um, about the mercury, I don't believe so. So seaweeds do bioaccumulate a lot of metals, but I don't, I'm not sure about mercury, actually. I'd have to look that up. Yeah, I've, I've definitely one. heard of other, you know, like, yeah, a lot of other metals that do accumulate, but I'm not sure. Um, and I had one question, which is this um, seaweed in the top right of your picture of your variety of seaweeds uh, that looks like little towers and things. Um, oh, yeah. I'm just wondering how, like, how that is built, because I heard... I heard about people thinking that they discovered ancient, the remains of ancient civilizations off the coasts and then realizing that actually it was just structures like this. Is this the same kind of thing? Yeah, yeah so these are stromatolites and they are cyanobacteria. So they, they, they're cyanobacteria that, that they look like a rock, basically, but it's a, a rock that is alive. And it's, they say it's the most, yeah, the, 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 the closest thing that we have on Earth today that resembles the earliest kind of life forms. Um, and yes, if you if you did like a cross section, you'd see those kind of layers that kind of accumulate. Um, and yeah, you only have stromatolites in, in Western Australia um, and in the Bahamas, I believe. There's only like three places in the world where they still survive. And the ones that we have here are in like super, super salty water uh, where there's no, there's not many other kind of creatures that can live there. So they think that's partly why they can survive there because there's no like snails that graze on them or anything like that. Um, Cascarilis is saying that the stromatolites in Western Australia are so amazing. Big fan of the stromatolites. Um, Anyway, oh, we've also got a question from Leonardo asking, how many types of seaweed are there? Oh, thousands and thousands, Um, you know, and, and I'm sure that there's many that we don't even know exist. You know, um, because they, you know, there's the, the microscopic ones, and then yeah, there's the, obviously we know the bigger ones, and they tend to be in shallow water because they need to photosynthesize, so they need light. Um, but yeah, let's um, let's carry, carry on with your story. But I just got to very quickly respond to Catherine, who's asking what's going on with my mustache. Uh, it's a temporary mustache for fun because uh, there's a campaign going on at the moment by this guy called uh, Halfcut Jimmy or Jimmy Halfcut who's talking about the Daintree rainforest disappearing. So I shaved off half of my beard to send him a, p- a picture to contribute to his campaign. And you should check it out because it's a cool campaign. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll grow back my beard, I think, later. Anyway, do carry on, Adriana. I had the same question. So oh, right. <laughs> um, I'm thinking... Let's maybe move on to the big kelp forest photograph, you know, the one with the, with the big kelp. Yep. So we know that, um, yeah, so algae are important because they produce oxygen. And in fact, yeah, every second breath that we take is thanks to algae and seaweed. Um, they're also just incredibly productive in terms of just producing big amounts of biomass, you know, habitat. So this, this photograph is an example of a giant kelp forest. Uh, giant kelp forests are found in cool water of um, America, North America, South America. We still have some here in uh, Tasmania, although not many left because the water is getting warmer and warmer. Um, but these giant kelp forests are like, they can grow 
you know, between 30 and 60 centimeters a day, right? So that's a lot. Wow. Uh, they can grow incredibly fast. Um, kelp forests here in Australia are more productive, are 16 times more productive than the most productive wheat fields that we have in Australia. So seaweeds grow really, really fast. And that's partly because they're more primitive than, than land plants, right? They don't have roots. They don't have any structural kind of um, tissues as such. And that's why they can grow so, so fast. So, and then this biomass provides home and shelter uh, for hundreds of species. So they can make up, you know, ecosystems that are huge. And in Australia, we have a really big um, ecosystem that is dominated by seaweeds. It's called the Great Southern Reef. And this is a name that we came up with, or my colleagues came up with it, um, just because, you know, everybody knows about the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, but actually southern, the entire southern half of Australia is dominated by seaweeds. And it's, it's a very um, biodiverse system that has a lot of species that are found nowhere else on Earth. So we decided it wasn't getting enough love. And part of the reason was because it didn't actually have a name, an entity. And that's how the Great Southern Reef as a concept was um, created a few years ago by my colleagues. Um, so I, I have a video that I sent you that I think um, explains the story really well and also you know, provides some images to back it up. So maybe we can watch that. Here we go. Oh. We were doing some work right across Australia from New South Wales, around Tasmania, Southern Australia and Western Australia. And there's so much passion among divers, fishers, surfers, everyone we talk to, just so passionate about their local reefs. And everybody would tell you, oh, we've got the best local reef here, or we've got the best secret spot for fishing, or we've got the best wave here. And we realised that essentially everybody was talking about the same thing. They were all the same sort of species they were catching, the same sort of environments they are interacting with. And we realised that there's just this broad passion right across this place. We need to harness this energy and try and sort of put a voice behind it. Just like the Great Barrier Reef, we have a southern equivalent um, that is equally unique in terms of its biodiversity. It's equally valuable in terms of the ecosystem services it provides. And, and we basically felt that it deserved uh, a great identity. And um, so what name better than the Great Southern Reef? So I think with the Great Southern Reef, it's, it was a really inspired idea to give it a name because I think it then recognizes the interconnectedness of all these systems that are thousands of kilometers apart, but they share some very common features, you know, like the, the presence of this golden kelp, you know, along 8,000 kilometers of coastline. That is tremendous, right? And by giving it a name, we're helping people to connect with it across the entirety of the southern coast of Australia. I really like the idea of the Great Southern Reef. It, it's like an underline, <laughs> an underlying Australia and even supporting it. You know, you could say, okay, this, this is a, an ecosystem that supports the weight of the unique ecology of, of the Australian continent. From a commercial perspective, branding what we have out the front is just, just makes sense. There's interlinked reef stretching whole way through and you've got all sorts of different depths you've got all sorts of different species that support you know humans like in every aspect this done properly will be huge the spiritual connection is really deep it's um something that all people that are saltwater people feel that the spirit that comes from within the sea is something that is like deep within your blood. My hope for the Great Southern Reef is to unite a lot of the pride and passion that we see right across Southern Australia. I think it's a great idea to identify the area as the Great Southern Reef. It gives everybody a name to put to something which supports the diversity of industries that we have here. We need to ensure that the Great Southern Reefs are looked after. They've been looking after us now for decades and going forward we need to make decisions in their interests. 
we have some really large challenges facing the Great Southern Reef. And by uniting our efforts, uniting our calls to look after and protect the Great Southern Reef, we can achieve a lot and maintain it for future generations to come. Um, so should we, you've got another, a few videos, other more videos that you wanted to show, but also um, I'm aware that you were going to tell us about uh, how this kind of symbiosis evolved, which I think is such a cool story. And I'm wondering which you want to do first. Let's leave that until the end, because I'm kind of thinking otherwise we won't get through the rest of the stuff. Okay. Um, so the Great Southern Reef is a really good example of temperate, so cool water systems dominated by seaweeds. The seaweeds provide the home for hundreds of species. Um, but um, in other systems, the seaweeds are not so much habitat, but they're food, they get eaten. Um, and coral reefs are a really good example of that. So in the other video, the other video doesn't have any sound and I can, I can talk over it if you like. Um, so it's just, um, it's just a little video, like a GoPro video uh, from One Tree Island in the Great Barrier Reef beautiful place. Um, so in a coral reef, what we see is that a lot of the fish that we see there, and if you're showing the video, you'll see that there's all these fish just picking, picking at the seafloor. You don't know what they're eating, right? But they're actually eating algae. And they are incredibly voracious, kind of vegetarian fish. They're so good at eating the algae that there's no algae to be seen. So when you go there, the system is dominated by corals, which are animals. But the reason why the corals can kind of thrive is because there's all these fish that are constantly eating the algae. So the algae, essentially nearly 100% of what the algae produces is eaten up by the fish. So there's actually very, very low biomass of, of algae, but they're still playing a really important role in the ecosystem, right? So in the tropics, they provide a lot of food. In cooler places, they provide more like structural kind of habitat. But I guess, um, you know, the title of the talk was, you know, can seaweed save the planet? So maybe um, we could move to, to that. Um, so for that, I wanted to ask um, you and people, um, so if we were to save the planet, like what, what are the main threats? You know, what are the most pressing problems that we're facing at the moment, other than coronavirus, of course, uh, COVID-19? I'm not sure that seaweeds will, although you never know. Uh, some seaweeds can produce very um, interesting drugs. But um, yeah, what do people think? What are the main threats that we face, that humanity faces, that the Earth faces? So we've got climate change, plastic pollution, coral bleaching. Um, I think there are there are obviously other well there's further uh, infectious diseases. Um, yeah, no, that's a really it's a really good runoff, start. Uh, so eutrophication, Cameron's saying everything. Uh, Leo is saying excessive consumption. Yeah. So yeah. So say climate change, pollution, like including plastic pollution. Um, plastic, yeah, um, food, food security, like, you know, having enough food in the planet. Um, so seaweeds can help with, with all of this, basically. So I just thought I'd kind of go one by one um, talking about how seaweeds, for example, can be really important to help us curb climate change. So obviously, climate change is caused by the increases of CO2. But also other greenhouse gases, right? Like methane. Um, and so if we start with, with, with carbon first, so, um, because uh, seaweeds grow so fast and they photosynthesize, um, they're basically taking carbon out of the water, which essentially is drawing it out of the atmosphere, right? So they, seaweeds can be really, can play a really important role in, in soaking up some of this excess carbon from the atmosphere. Um, like I said, for example, giant kelp, microcystis, can grow, you know, 30 to 60 centimeters a day. So this is kind of a lot faster than land plants. So the problem with, with land plants is that, yeah, they just grow a lot more slow, slowly, like They're terrestrial lazy. forests do. They're lazy, those land plants. Yeah. But also they, you know, unfortunately, um, they burn, you know, they're affected by fires. And here in Australia, that that 
problem has, has obviously been at the forefront of everybody's minds because of the of the fires that we had at the beginning of the year, you know, between November and and, and yeah, February. So, you know, all that carbon that those forests had accumulated went up in flames, right? So seaweeds um, are underwater, they're not affected by fires, and they grow really fast. So they can really be a part of the solution when it comes to actually capturing some of this excess carbon. Um, I have one question for you, by the way, just on that. If, um, just yeah. coming from, from Pangolin saying, surely if they don't have roots, though, they can't store as much carbon? Question mark. Yeah, um, it's a really good question. So the thing about seaweeds is, um, so they take up a lot of carbon, they capture it, they turn it into biomass, but then they normally live in wave exposed places where the carbon will not get sequestered onto the seafloor, essentially. In what, so, so wave exposed, as in like coastal, so constantly backed yeah. up by the way it's gotten. Exactly. So, so. So yeah, so sequestration doesn't happen where the algae live, but what happens is all this rack that gets produced when there's a big storm or when the seaweed kind of, you know, dies, gets broken off, all that biomass, well, a, a high proportion of that can end up in the deep sea. So, you know, below a thousand meters and that's where it gets sequestered. A lot so of seaweed also ends up in, in mangrove sorry. forests. Oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Just for those who don't know, se sequestration will be the storage of carbon within something living. Um, it's the word we use when carbon dioxide comes out of the atmosphere and stores it in the living thing, in case anyone didn't know. Maybe you all already did. Anyway, sorry, carry on. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a very important concept, basically, because, you know, so, you know, when, when yeah, you can take carbon, for example, if, if you took the carbon of the seaweed that has been accumulated and you just left it in on the beach, that would eventually kind of biodegrade and that carbon would go back to the atmosphere. So that's not sequestration, right? It's like it comes back out. But if the seaweed ends up in a place where um, there's no oxygen and certain conditions, that's when the carbon can be locked away for millennia. It's never forever, obviously, but for a long time. Um, so, so there's also this other question from uh, Oliver saying, and there's, there's a great question from Cascarales, which I want to ask as well in a sec, but the one from Oliver says, uh, could they be used to deacidify the oceans as well if they're taking up carbon? Yes, um, yeah. So during photosynthesis, the, the, they actually raise the pH of the water. So yes, it kind of counteracts um, acidification. In fact, there's a lot of interest in growing kelp um, next to aquaculture facilities that are, you know, like oyster farms, for example, because they can actually um, yeah, offset some of the ocean acidification that is already happening. So yeah. So for the carbon um, kind of part of this, I had a clip um, that comes from a movie called uh, 2040. Uh, so I don't know whether many people have watched that movie. Have you seen it, Matthew? I actually haven't seen the film yet. I really want to. I know that it was played straight after the session that we did with George Monbiot and loads of our students went straight off to see it. So I reckon a lot of people on here have maybe seen it. Um, but it's okay. going to be. So we could, either, we could either show the clip or not. Um, whatever you think. Um, it, it, it kind sure. of summarizes the potential of kelp um, for capturing carbon. And, you know, there's, it's still... So the, the premise of 2040 is, you know, using technology and concepts available today, um, how can we make a better future for 2040? And so the concepts that are drawn on um, for this kelp story are, they kind of exist, but in very rudimentary kind of level. You know, there's still a lot of science that is not yet developed, a lot of questions, um, but um, the, the concept is an interesting one and there's, there's something in it, you know? Here we go. A lot of votes for share the clip. Let's do it. Okay. Until recently, large seaweed forests ran along many of the world's coastlines. They provided habitats for marine life, local food and jobs, and made for terrific fake beards. But with most of the heat from global warming going into our oceans, much of this seaweed has been wiped out, including 95% of kelp along the east coast of Tasmania. But there is a solution. Scientists have discovered a way to regenerate the seaweeds. 
They pump cooler, nutrient-rich water from the deep ocean and disperse it over a seaweed-growing platform near the surface. Seaweeds actually draw down carbon dioxide from the ocean waters, and they restore the alkalinity of the ocean that enables shellfish and other creatures to thrive. Apart from restoring ecosystems, seaweed could also play a crucial role in reversing global warming. Well, this is an example of brown seaweed. Mm -hmm. The fastest brown seaweeds will grow a half a meter per day. Hang on. Half a meter a day? Half a meter a day, and they'll grow over 50 meters long. Is that one of the fastest growing plants in the world? It is the fastest growing tree in the, on the planet. Wow, well, okay. So, so that's why the understanding of it, that it's going to be pulling carbon out of the atmosphere very quickly, yes. because it grows so fast. Thousands of tons of carbon per square kilometer per year. But this humble weed has even more to offer. Seaweed is good for food, fertilizer, biofuels, plastics, healthy omega-3s, fibers for clothes, nutraceuticals, for feeding to cattle to lower their methane, and of course, fake beards. 2040 is collaborating with the Climate Foundation, the University of Tasmania, and the Intrepid Foundation to launch Australia's first seaweed platform in Storm Bay, near Hobart. But we need your help. For every dollar you donate today, the Intrepid Foundation will match that dollar. So together, we have an opportunity to make Australia a world leader in this exciting climate solution. So donate now and help the regeneration. Wow. A lot of people thought that was pretty amazing. I, um, I've stopped here over a picture uh, containing a cow and some divers at some seaweed. Is that where you stopped? Okay, cool. Yeah. Excellent. So, yeah, so I guess, um, yeah, it's a very inspiring kind of story that kind of shows the potential, right? Um, the other way that seaweeds can be very important to help us curb climate change is um, by reducing methane emissions. So methane is a greenhouse gas. It is a lot more powerful um, than carbon dioxide. Um, and in Australia, I think it's 10% of our greenhouse emissions are methane. Yeah. And methane is produced by cows. Um, so and it's produced by cows uh, mostly uh, by, by them burping. So about 90% of the methane production, I think, is by burping, and 10% are farts. Um, so, um, so this methane is produced by the bacteria that are inside the cow, and when they're breaking down the plant matter that the cow is eating, there's a certain type of bacteria that produces methane as a byproduct, you know, while they're breaking down the organic matter. So obviously, microbes and bacteria are super important for digestion um, in, in, in us and in cows. But this particular type, they're archaea bacteria, the ones that produce the methane. And um, they actually don't help that much with the digestion. So um, a few years ago, some scientists kind of started thinking about, you know, is there something that we could give as an added component to the diets of cows um, that would kill these archaea bacteria, the ones that produce the methane, without harming the cow, obviously, and without harming all the good bacteria that are doing good things. And it was actually a group of Australian scientists um, from James Cook University and from the CSIRO. They discovered that there's a seaweed um, called asparagopsis. It's a red seaweed. It produces a lot of bromoform. And not only does it produce it, but it actually stores it in its cells and uses it as a chemical defense itself. Um, so it has high concentrations of bromoform, and bromoform kills archaea bacteria. So they started doing some trials, and, and yeah, it's, it's been found super effective. By feeding the cows a bit of asparagopsis, and it doesn't have to be a big component of the diet, like less, less, I believe it's less than 5%, um, definitely less than 10, um, you can kill 99% of the methane-producing bacteria. So now there's like, you know, lots of trials going on about, like the big kind of difficulty now is how do you use how do you make enough asparagopsis? How do you grow enough asparagopsis um, to 
feed you know Australia's cattle and the world, I guess. So that's a very exciting kind of bit of research that is happening right now. One of the things I think is really cool about that is the um, very old, now very old story of Moby Dick. When you see the when you when you when you read about the cows on Nantucket Islands just kind of scratching around on the beach and eating seaweed and. <clears throat> That's a relative. That's a relatively early piece of evidence that cows will naturally just graze on seaweed as part of their part of their healthy diet. It's thought by a lot of people now that cows are supposed to be coastal creatures, and that actually feeding them um, seaweed like this this red seaweed here may not be unhealthy for them at all. If anything, it may be part of their natural diet that we've been depriving them of. And so, yeah, this is not something that people should think of as like, well, this is a really big intervention in diet. It could actually just be restoring what is supposed, how it's supposed to be. Mm. Yeah, I, I've even heard, I read a newspaper article that in there's somewhere in, in, I think it's in Scotland, where there's these goats that just, you know, they, they actually only eat seaweed pretty much. And they are, you know, you know, obviously kind of deemed more sustainable, etc. So yeah, it's definitely a thing, not just with um, cows, yeah. So, you know, so seaweeds can change or can help us save the world by reducing climate change, but also by producing food. So obviously there's parts, you know, of the planet like Asia, Japan, you know, China, Korea, where they already eat a lot of seaweed. But um, in the Western world in general, we, we don't eat much seaweed and we should because it's really, really, really good for you. So I have that photo that shows a little bit of sushi and, and the Got different it. kind of seaweeds. So, I mean, sushi, you know, the seaweed that's, that, you know, you find with the rice, like that's probably the, the seaweed that people are most familiar with. And that's, that's nori. Um, so that's probably the, the, one of the ones that gets produced, you know, at the highest kind of um, volume. Um, but there's lots of other types of seaweed that are absolutely delicious. And again, because they grow really fast, they can be a really kind of sustainable um, mariculture enterprise. Um, it, you know, it doesn't have the kind of land changing problems that uh, we have on, you know, in other systems, etc. They also have really high concentrations of very nutritious kind of elements that we don't get enough of, you know, like, I don't know, like, potassium, magnesium, zinc, iron. Um, so the green algae that is in the photo, Alva, um, has five, uh, I think it has more iron than spinach, for example. Um, and then some, some other seaweeds have more potassium than bananas, you know. So and different species obviously have different traits. So, and these are Brussels um, sprout know, seaweeds, right? Sorry? These are Brussels sprout seaweeds, are they? kind of thing right they yeah they call it well they call them sea lettuce actually the one on that has like the little bubbles they call that sea caviar oh, that and it's a bit of a one. yeah it's, it's beautiful it's like it's like it has these balls that kind of pop in your mouth it's um yeah really delicious um but yeah so you know arguably as the population continues to grow um we're going to have more and more problems feeding the planet and one untapped source of food are seaweeds, and I think particularly in the Western world, um, we could really do with incentivizing uh, seaweed farming, um, essentially. So in answer to the question from earlier, um, I think I think there's huge potential. I think um, we, ju we just need to, we, we need incentives, you know, from, from higher up to get this going. Um, and that, you know, they could become the next superfoods, you know, just like everybody started eating quinoa and whatever. Um, but this is a very sustainable option. I think here's a good um, myth that we can bust. So, so Green Mango Man is saying, I kind of want to eat seaweed, but I heard they are contaminated with lots of mercury and other toxic materials. Is this true or false? Okay, so because of the question earlier from Mercury, I just did a, a, a quick Google Scholar search. So, you know, scientists, we have our own kind of Google that allows us to look at scientific papers. And Mercury is one of the metals that is least accumulated by seaweeds. And so I saw a study where they actually specifically looked at the metals that are problematic and their concentrations in, you know, um, commercially available seaweeds, and they're, they're definitely way below um, what would be a problem for health. So, so yeah, no, no, no evidence of that. 
Also, Leonardo is saying superfoods are not real. I heard that on another AIM High lesson. And Leonardo, yes, you will have heard that on the uh, lesson from Hannah from Dr. Hannah Bolland at Oxford about um, about cancer. And it, he, she was she was talking about how superfoods are often misadvertised. But still, we start to use the word superfood colloquially to just mean a really healthy food, um, of which seaweed is is one. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. I mean, when I said superfood, I guess I meant precisely on this kind of PR kind of, you know, so it can become a fashionable thing, you know, that is also really good for you. Um, but that is, 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 you know, there's a bit of a hype that goes with, you know, with it that increases demand. And I guess that's what we need for seaweeds because, uh, you know, still a lot of people in, in Western world think, yeah, seaweeds are not, something that humans should eat you know so that we, we need the thinking i love catherine's question here could we fully live on seaweed taking away every other food in our diet could we live just on seaweed yeah um, um i mean i would say my, my immediate kind of answer would be probably not but just be just the same way you shouldn't really eat on only one thing whatever it is even if it's lentils um but it, it does have like some species have relatively high protein uh equivalent you know to some of the other you know land plants that have more protein so if you if you were able to take seaweeds from all over the world and mix up different species, you probably would get a, you know, a diet that wasn't too bad. There might be some, like if you only ate seaweed, yeah, you might get into some type of problem that I can't even think of now. <laughs> Great question, Catherine. Isn't it amazing to think how we just don't know the answers to loads of these things? Like Absolutely, these, are, these yeah. are questions Absolutely. that we need to try and answer. Um, yeah. Anyway, where do um, you want to go next? Yeah. The other thing about food, um, so I, I, I sent you a photo of a fish farm. These are rabbit fish. Um, oh, the rabbit fish. Yeah. And what's that? Yeah, the rabbit fish. Got them. Yeah. So basically, that's the other way that we could use seaweed as food. So the biggest problem with aquaculture of fish is that we tend to eat uh, and farm fish species that are piscivores. So they eat other fish. So to feed them, we actually have to go out into the ocean and fish and, you know, fish anchovies or, you know, and then we, we turn those anchovies into pellets but then we feed to the fish. And in general, we need to put in more fish in than we actually get out, right? So that's just that's a big problem. Um, so what we could do is what we've done on land and instead, or instead of farming um, the serious fish, we could farm herbivorous fish so vegetarian fish like you know cows are vegetarian right so and what would you feed those fish you would treat them seaweed right so that that's another way that i think seaweeds can become really important in, in, in producing food for the planet and the advantage with that is that a lot of seaweeds have um, antibacterial properties and so you could potentially get to a point where you don't have to put antibiotics into the fish farms because a lot of those defenses are actually coming in from the seaweed itself. Amazing. Yeah. So, um, so I guess the, another way that seaweeds can save the world is by, by helping us fix up pollution. Um, so... Uh, there's many ways that this can happen. Um, I think I sent you a photo of, of um, Chris Pre like a Chris big Prager. mediation of plant. Like, is, is that like a circuit that goes around? Yeah, where they're, where they're using sea lettuce to treat water. Yeah, exactly. So basically, because seaweeds grow really fast, they take up nutrients really fast from the water, you can use them to, to soak up the excess nutrients that are produced, for example, in prawn farms. So the prawns get fed pellets, the prawns, uh, they poo, a lot of that kind of poo ends up being, you know, toxic. So, you know, the water that comes out of the, of the prawn farm, you can't just release it into the environment because it's, it's toxic. It has too many nutrients. What you could do is set up a system where that water feeds um, algae and then the algae soak up the nutrients and then you can do use something useful with that algae biomass afterwards. So that's what we call bioremediation. And seaweeds are, again, like really, really good for that. Another, another way, is, and it's kind of related to this, is what we call integrated marine trophic aquaculture, IMTA. And it's basically, so if you're going to have a fish farm in the ocean, um, again, the fish are going to produce a lot of nutrients just by, by 
pooing essentially. So if you can put seaweeds right next to the sea farm, that can actually soak up some of those nutrients. And then, you know, you may not use that seaweed for human consumption, for example, but there's other uses for seaweed, like in agriculture as, you know, um, um, fertilizers, um, but they're organic fertilizers, they're, they're, you know, so, so yeah. That's something else that you could do. You use all the nutrients produced by this. It's a multi-trophic means, you know, so you have primary producers, the seaweeds, then you have secondary uh, or primary consumers. Uh, so you could have seaweeds, oysters that are filter feeders and fish, for example. So there are different trophic levels. They use nutrients in different ways. And you're kind of closing the circle in a way. It's like a circular economy kind of concept, uh, but in a, you know, aquaculture kind of setting. And where everything gets set up, uh, used up, and and there's no waste as such. And I guess um, talking about waste, the, the that's the last kind of um, you know saving the world kind of uh, solutions that seaweeds can provide. So I sent you a little photo from an article about the London Marathon. Uh, so in 2019, um, you know, in 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 marathons. Obviously, runners need to drink water, and usually, you, you, what used to happen is that um, the runners would just grab bottles of water that get put on the side for them to drink. But that, of course, um, is single-use plastics, and so it ends up in the, in the side of the road. And we're talking about hundreds of thousands of water bottles, right? So, um, what they did last year is they they use this thing called uh, they're called seaweed pouches or seaweed pots and it's essentially like little bubbles um, that the membrane is made out of seaweed. It doesn't taste like seaweed, it doesn't taste of like anything, but inside it you have the water um, and just shows how, yeah, seaweed materials and seaweeds, um, yeah, five, you know, the material of, of seaweed can be used for all this cool kind of um, waste re reduction kind of solutions, you know, so and this company, it's based in the UK, the company that does this, um, and they've done it with water. But, you know, I think in music festivals, you can get little pouches with, I don't know, like some sort of cocktail mixture or whatever. Or you could have it with like ketchup, you know, instead of having a plastic thing of ketchup, you could, you know, in the fish and chips, uh, you could just um, use this. And it's a material that biodegrades naturally in six weeks. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, you know. A kind of very exciting uh, new solution. So I had I had one of these full of water. Um, I can't remember if I ate it though. Would I have eaten it? Yeah, so you can eat it, and it's absolutely fine. Or like the membrane, you, you, if you don't like it, you could just throw it out, and it literally will just decompose really quickly. Lots of companies are working on this. You know, how can we use seaweed to replace plastic essentially even you know in the coffee cups the disposable coffee cups you know that plastic that lines the inside so they're trying to work out a way of using seaweed derived material instead of plastic because that would decompose and then it would be a compostable paper cup right so there's huge huge potential and a lot of people working on this and what about these seaweed socks that people were saying were talking about smelly socks at the beginning, but you can make uh, clothes out of seaweed, can you? You can, yeah. Yeah, you can make, um, yeah, you can make clothes out of seaweed. There's like, you know, you just go through this process where you, you know, you extract certain components of the seaweed and then you turn it into a fiber um, that is perfectly kind of, you know, durable. But then if, if you did end up throwing it away, like it would actually decompose a lot faster than, say, cotton and um, if it was in the right environment right so so yeah um, and it uses less water than cotton and etc etc so yeah um, I, I believe H&M are already uh, uh, selling I think I think seaweed soles so some of their shoe soles have seaweed material like so it's this is like there's lots of people working on this and there's already products out there um, so yeah huge promise so the last video is just um, to tell people about a project that uh, I run here in Australia uh, with some colleagues and that it's about restoring a seaweed that went missing. Uh, it went missing because of pollution and we have effectively kind of reversed local extinction and brought it back after it having been missing for decades. Um, so, you know, it's not it's not about seaweed saving the world, it's about us saving seaweed. Um, but uh, I thought some people might enjoy it. 
Cool. Yeah, let's definitely watch it. Here we go. Marine ecologists Dr. Adriana Verges and Ziggy Marzinelli are two of the lead scientists behind Operation Crayweed, a Sydney Institute of Marine Science project that is working to restore vital submarine forests that were once common in this area, but completely disappeared due to water pollution around 40 years ago. So we're about to jump in to collect crayweed from one of the sites where it still thrives naturally. Uh, we're in Palm Beach and this is the northernmost, um, well, this is the edge of where it disappeared essentially. So we collect it from here and then we're going to transplant this crayweed over to Sydney Metropolitan, to Shelley Beach. We're rewilding or reforesting the Sydney coastline with forests that are really diverse and productive and that are part of, the, part of this area and unfortunately went missing a while ago. So unless we do something about it, it's not going to revert. Crayweed forests are an essential part of these temperate marine ecosystems. And like forests on land, they support hundreds of other species. The team collects adult donor crayweed plants from areas like this one, just outside the affected zone. And they have spent years developing and perfecting the method they now use to transplant the seaweed back into affected areas. Some of these individuals are male and some are female. And this one, for example, looks like a female, which has rounder reproductive organs. The process of translocating them is stressful enough that they release uh, the reproductive gametes, like the eggs and the sperm. And this is what is the beginning of a self-sustaining population over in Shelly Beach. The team have already successfully reintroduced crayweed to a number of sites around Sydney. And their most recent site is this one in the aquatic reserve off Shelly Beach near Manly. The team will attach the adult plants they collected further north to mats fixed to the sea floor. These adult plants will never reattach themselves to the seabed. What they hope is that conditions here will be good enough for the male and female donor plants to make lots of babies, or crabies, as the team affectionately knows them. It is these new individuals that will begin the natural process of reforesting the Sydney coastline to create more food, habitat, and reproductive surfaces for the benefit of every creature that lives here. I love the term crabies. Such a good name. <laughs> also, that, um, <clears throat> that beach is where my twin lives, actually, Shelley Beach. Um, and last time I was there, I got absolutely covered in blue bottle stings from those uh, jellyfish. I was like literally wrapped in a stingers. Terrible disaster. Um, but yeah, Shelly Beach is amazing. I didn't realize that you restored all of the, um, that was where you have restored it to. I knew you were restoring the coastline, but that is amazing. I must have been in the restored forests. Yeah. That is so cool. It's one of, yeah, that's one of our places, yeah. Being stung though, I guess. But um, anyway, right, I'm just going to, I'm going to really quickly uh, wrap up and go to the kind of, well, I'll, I'll tell everyone what's coming up next on High, And then we're going to go to questions. So stay on if you've got questions. And those who've already asked questions, I've, I've written them down. So we're going to go to those as well. Um, before we part, I just want to show you guys what is coming up next, though. So um, on Thursday, the 13th of August, we've got biologist and science communicator um, Dr. Sally Waring from the American Museum of Natural History, who is basically, she's going to go to a pond near her house pull out a little bit of water and just show us the incredible amount of life inside, which is going to be unbelievable. Uh, she's like a huge Instagram star from doing this uh, on, on the internet and you guys are going to love it. So put that in your diaries. That's Thursday, the, the 13th of August. And then after her, we've got Dr. Sarah Pearson, who is an astrophysicist and science communicator. She's the NASA Hubble Fellow of New York University. And I recently went to the most incredible presentation of hers 
about galaxies and stars and is going to blow everyone's mind. Um, so put the 20th of August into your diary as well. And also, uh, as soon as today, we've got stuff coming up. So at 4 p.m. today, so that is in four hours if you're in a different time zone to the UK, uh, Dr. Hannah Bolland is doing Why Do We Get Shorter As We Get Older? Uh, and next week, we've got uh, we've got a session on high school physics, on astronomy, solar systems, and exoplanets. Nish is going to do a lesson on what does courage look like? And Phil Wilcox, who is running our English and our poetry, is going to continue with the book that has been co-written co with all the people on AIM High and himself. So if you want to be in a published book, and in fact, we've got another meeting coming up with the publisher quite soon, but if you want to be in the, in the published book and contribute to it, Go to Phil's lesson as well to get involved in that poetry. It's going to all be climate and ecology themed stuff. Um, so yes, questions in a moment, but just very quickly to say uh, thanks for everyone who has come along to this. Um, if you haven't already, please follow our socials, which you can see here um, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and TikTok. And we've got one on Byte as well now, if you want to follow that. Uh, sign up for our schedule if you haven't already, uh, and please spread the word. And finally, if you want to give us feedback, that would be great. If you're on the Aim High website, you can do that just directly below the stream. And we are learning loads from people who've already done that. So it's all really, really appreciated. So thanks so much um, for uh, for doing that. Right, let's go to questions. So, uh, Dr. Adriana, we have several uh, quite good questions. Um, so, uh, well, I'll just give them to you one by one. And you can tell me uh, when you have to go, because we've already run over by one minute. But I want to give you a few. In fact, why don't I just give you three at a time and you can see what you can what you want to answer most. So um, Jeff has asked, could uh, seaweeds be used to replace fossil fuels? Uh, the Internet of Things has asked, how quickly could we um, scale up the, the use of seaweed to, to try and fix fix the planet? Um, and finally, there was another question. Uh, I can't remember who it's from, but about um, GMO seaweed and is there much GMO being done? Hmm. Oh, they're all really good questions. Okay, so yeah, algae as biofuels is something that a lot of people are interested in. So this would be, you know, like say if you produce a lot of algae, essentially use that as the fuel itself. It's possible. There's lots of people that are working on it. The biggest kind of challenge at the moment is making it economically viable, you know, so it's an economy of scale kind of issue. So there's potential there. But um, yeah, there's still more development needed. Um, in terms of how long it would take, it kind of it's the same thing, you know. It's, it's it's just you know how much money can we throw into this? You know how much can we incentivize this kind of green approaches? Um, and I think if 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 we put enough money, like the the change can happen really fast, you know. All that we need to know, like a lot of the basics, we already know them. It's just now about scaling up. So it's, it's, it becomes like an engineering kind of question, really. And um, I forgot the last one. Is um, it replacing fossil fuels? No. Oh, the G sorry, the GMO one. Oh, the GMOs, yeah. So the GMOs, um, genetically modified seaweeds might be um, appropriate in some cases, um, both for ecological reasons and potentially for commercial reasons. Like for example, imagine if you wanted to farm a seaweed in an area and you were afraid of the seaweed taking over native species, for example, so you could farm sterile um, specimens, for example. So that there, there are a lot of reasons why GMOs may be appropriate in some circumstances. Uh, I have another two questions for you. Sorry for missing the answer on fossil fuels. I was because I was compiling the other questions. Um, the other questions are: uh, as, uh, When kelp disappears, um, what's what's replacing it? Is this because this is research you're doing at the moment, right? Yeah. So it depends. Like in some cases, it gets replaced by by turf algae, like microscopic algae. Um, and that's not a good thing because if you replace a big, beautiful, structurally complex kelp that you know that has a lot of habitat and shelter and food, if you replace it with very low biomass, um, you can lose that kind of habitat, right? The, um, and that's happening in some places. In other places, you have corals, um, tropical corals that are starting to replace um, the kelp in some parts of the world, like in Japan and some places here in Australia, or else you can get tropical species. So there's tropical seaweeds. They're not 
they're not kelps strictly speaking, but they can take over. So you're just changing a, a temperate cool water species for a tropical species. And they tend to just be very different, um, you know, but um, some functions may still be there basically, if you replace them with another seaweed. But that's that's rarely going to be a good thing, isn't it? Kind of trans transplanting a completely different seaweed into. Uh, I, I'm thinking this because uh, Pangolin sent a question uh, earlier on on, a, on another thing about um, about corals in the Red Sea being able to to survive very high temperatures. But that uh, that isn't a solution, is it? We can't just transplant that everywhere. No, but, it, but it's, yeah, it's an, like, yeah, a lot of scientists are interesting, interested in what we call bright spots. So, you know, places where or species or, or individuals that are doing better than you would expect, given the circumstances and trying to learn from those. And I think in a way, you know, the Red Sea and, you know, because of the high temperatures, there's a lot that we can learn about how this species managed to survive here that we could potentially use for other corals. But the same kind of applies to the seaweeds, you know, so in the in Tasmania, we're losing the giant kelp. There, there are still some individuals that managed to survive. So what can we learn about their genetic makeup and, you know, why are they survivors? And, you know, can, can they be the seed for, you know, populations that can resist warmer temperatures? I mean, this should not be, a, a you know, a, a management solution in itself, really. Uh, we should, you know, stop, obviously, stop CO2 increasing. But as well as, as doing that, we should start to think about other kind of solutions. We have uh, two very small last questions and because uh, people are starting to say goodbye and I know we're running over and I know you need to get, yeah. get yourself home as well. Um, the last two questions are one, how are the cray babies going? And two, um, are you uh, having seaweed for dinner tonight? Or maybe you've already eaten. <laughs> um, the gravies are doing really well, really well. The ones in, in Shelly Beach are, are now kind of more teenagers, really. Um, so, yeah, um, and, and we kind of, we still keep getting new cravies, so that's a really good sign. Um, and whether I'm having seaweed for dinner, I don't know. It depends what my my, my beautiful husband has cooked for, uh, for me. I don't know. I hope so. Is, yeah, because it must be, it's 9.05 there now, isn't it? You've still got 40 minutes to get home. Yeah. We can let you it go so you can have a delicious Spanish dinner. Spanish time dinner in Australia. <laughs> of course. Um, well, yes, uh, thank you so much for coming on. It's been really appreciated both by me and obviously everyone who's who's been on here. So thank you so much for taking the time. Um, and uh, we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks so much, Adriana. Well, everyone, huh? nice to see you.